Hi, welcome back to the GBM Awareness Day broadcast, Honor, Learn, Act, Session 2. My name is Corey Yetkin, and I live in Irvine, California with my two daughters. I am also very proud to be a board member of the National Brain Tumor Society. I didn't know what GBM was until my husband woke up with the worst headache of his life, made his way to the ER, had surgery, and we were told that he had a glioblastoma. Michael was only 39 years old at the time, and we started off on this journey of not knowing what to do, what questions to ask. Thankfully, we were connected with the National Brain Tumor Society and they helped encourage us to find the answers that we needed. But more than that, they also provided us with an opportunity to act and advocate for what was really important to our family. We got involved with the National Brain Tumor Society and have raised over $100,000 to raise awareness about brain cancer. I'm so proud to be a member of this community. It's a community that you didn't know that you needed and you didn't wanna be a part of and are so grateful that they are there to support you every step of the way. When I think of my family, this is the picture that comes to mind, my husband, Michael, and our two girls. The picture that you currently see at the top of the GBM Awareness Day page is the last family photo that we took together. It's a very difficult photo for me to see, and it's a very difficult photo to share. But I think what it does is it truly shows the journey of what a family goes through when a loved one has been diagnosed with GBM. It was important for me to show it and share our family's story to let, other know, to let others know that they are not alone in this journey. You have the support of the National Brain Tumor Society, and you have the support of me should you ever need it. It was the roughest point in our family's journey. And just because Michael died, it doesn't mean that another family needs to go through this. We need to raise awareness, we need to raise dollars for research, and we need to continue hoping for a cure. And together with the National Brain Tumor Society, we can do that. I'm so grateful for all of the people that have been in our lives, as I'm sure that you are for the ones that have helped support you on your journey. I'd like to thank each of you, the survivors, the patients, the care partners, the researchers, and all of the providers who shared your reality with us today. It is so important to be a part of this community and work together. Today, you have that opportunity to honor, learn, and act. When we first started participating with the National Brain Tumor Society, I felt that our day had purpose, that it was important to reach out and to let our legislators know that our voices mattered your voice matters and your story matters. Last year, I had the distinct honor of speaking and sharing our story at the first annual GBM MBTS GBM Awareness Day. And I am so grateful for that opportunity. I wanna thank each one of you from our family, from our, from our daughters, our biggest gifts, and from so many other families. We appreciate your time and your attention today and every day to create cures and quality of life for patients and for families. Together, we will defeat GBM. I live every day by Michael's fam motto that became our family motto of living each day glass half full. We can do this together and we will. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Justin Jordan and I'm a neuro-oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I'm grateful for the opportunity to join you all on marking this occasion of the second federally recognized Glioblastoma Awareness Day. I'm thankful to our esteemed members of Congress for their public acknowledgement of this disease and its profound impact on so many Americans. And I'm also thankful to the patients and caregivers and advocacy organizations such as the National Brain Tumor Society for their ongoing campaign of advocacy and support. I arrived at a career in neuro-oncology, unfortunately, through an experience with glioblastoma in my own family. And now, both from my experience as a glioblastoma caregiver and that of a neuro-oncologist, I can tell you without a doubt that marking Glioblastoma Awareness Day serves a number of really important purposes. First, this National Day of Awareness brings validation and recognition to the experience of tens of thousands of patients and caregivers who are or have been impacted by this disease. It also serves as an opportunity to educate the public toward a goal of not only earlier diagnosis for some, but also greater empathy from all. It serves as a reminder to healthcare professionals to keep the possibility of glioblastoma in mind when approaching patients with new neurological symptoms. And finally, 
The recognition of glioblastoma awareness is crucial for the larger goal of finding better treatments or even a cure someday. In order to advance therapies, we need to continue our partnerships with elected officials and federal funding agencies and pharmaceutical companies, researchers, patients, advocacy organizations, and so many more. Today, we mark the opportunity to renew those relationships and redouble our efforts in this very important work together. When I meet with patients diagnosed with glioblastoma, as well as their caregivers, we bond around several important topics. First, I educate and empathize with the gravity of their diagnosis and the enormous and unpredictable impact it has on their goals and dreams. But secondly, and arguably more importantly, I bring hope to every such meeting. We talk about standard treatments and research. We talk about the aspects of that patient's care that are unique. And we talk about holistic approaches to disease management, including the critical role of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and mental health. In summary, the most important aspects that come from every visit between a patient with glioblastoma and their provider, empathy, education, action, and hope, are the very same outcomes we strive for today on Glioblastoma Awareness Day. Thank you very much for being here to join me. Thank you to the following sponsors for supporting National Brain Tumor Society's GBM Awareness Day event. Hello, my name is David Andrews. I'm a neuro-oncologic neurosurgeon who for the past 30 years has striven to develop a cell-based cure for glioblastoma. I've seen the courage of these patients and their families as they face this disease. So it is with great commitment that those of us at IMVAX are proud to sponsor the Senate and House resolution to establish the second annual Glioblastoma Awareness Day on July 22nd. We are therefore committed to continue to advance research, treatments, and care of these courageous patients. This portion of Glioblastoma Awareness Day is brought to you by IMVAX. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Finnamore and I'm speaking to you today from Manhattan. My husband, John Mark, just passed away in April of glioblastoma at age 30. John was a neurology resident at NYU when he was diagnosed and his dream was to help people with neurological movement disorders like Parkinson's. He was one of the kindest people I've ever met and he was here to make the world a better place and he did for the 30 years he was alive, but he had so much more to offer. During our fight against glioblastoma, we did treatments, trials for 26 months. Treating glioblastoma is frustrating because there hasn't been much movement in the past 20 plus years in terms of treatments or cures. Clinical trials are hard to come by and in some cases expensive but families do whatever they can because this kind of research buys people the only thing that matters, which is more time with their loved one. Just like I, my grief didn't pause when the world did for COVID, we can't take a pause on working to find a cure and to find treatments for the thousands of people diagnosed each year. When John was first diagnosed, he said to me, I had forever and now I don't. Because of his career, he knew what he was up against. No one should ever hear a diagnosis and feel that helpless. When John was sick, I used to go running to clear my head. It was constantly so much difficult news and difficult appointments, and I found running really allowed me to focus on what was important, which was spending time with John. This passion led me to join the Grey Nation Endurance Team with MBTS, um, and we were set to run the marathon in New York this year. Through that program, I met so many amazing people, all of whom unfortunately were deeply affected by brain tubers. I'm involved in GBM Day because my husband was an advocate for research, for neurological research, and because he won't get the time on earth to continue to make a difference, I will be doing it for both of us. Today I will honor John by being kind to others, by telling his story, 
by showing compassion, like he always did. I will act. I will help fund research. I will work with NBTS to lobby. I will take action to make sure that people diagnosed in the future don't feel as helpless as we did. And I will learn more. I, I wish I had known more about brain tumors before they directly affected me, but I didn't. And now it's my time to learn as much as I can and to tell our story so that others can learn as well. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Jan Tchaikovsky and I represent the 9th Congressional District of Illinois. I am the author of a resolution along with my uh, Republican colleague, Congressman Mast, that would declare July 22nd as Glioblastoma Awareness Day. Uh, it's very important that we lift up this issue because 10,000 Americans die every year of this disease. It is the most common and the most deadly of the brain tumors, the brain diseases, and 10,000 Americans die each year because of it. My very, very dear friend, very close friend of my husband, and me, um, has this uh, has glioblastoma and is fighting every single day, and we are standing with him in the hopes that he may be able to continue to live. But in the meantime, the House Appropriations Committee also um, passed language in the appropriations bill that recognizes that glioblastoma is the most common and most deadly form of brain cancer and supports additional uh, research on glioblastoma. And so I want to thank you. We count on you to be our partner to make this happen. Um, there is no reason why this richest country in the world can't put more resources into finding a cure, making sure that we can stop the deadly stock of uh, glioblastoma. It's a frightening, it's a very, very frightening diagnosis right now, and hopefully if we continue the research, it won't have to be that way in the future. So let's work together, let's get it done, Thank you for your efforts. I'm Meredith Buxton. I'm the CEO for the Global Coalition for Adaptive Research. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded to work in close collaboration with patient and research organizations like the National Brain Tumor Society, the clinical, scientific, and academic community, and most notably patients to build and run innovative and state-of-the-art trials to accelerate drug development for rare and deadly diseases. We're honored to be here today to share more about our efforts to support patients with glioblastoma. We are working on an innovative and state-of-the-art trial called GBM Agile, and this trial is designed to accelerate drug development for patients with newly diagnosed and recurrent GBM. GBM Agile is a brain trial of over 120 doctors and scientists working together with a goal to rethink what we can do for GBM. The goal of GBM Agile is to improve drug supply to the clinic, newer drugs and better drugs for our patient with GBM so that we can improve the survival of patient with this terrible disease. What is so unique about GBM Agile? GBM Agile is a very innovative platform trial using Bayesian adaptive randomization. In this way, multiple therapies can be evaluated quicker, more efficiently, and more cost-effectively than traditional methods. In this way, we hope to find better treatments for glioblastomas a lot sooner than with the traditional uh, trial designs. GBM Agile is a potentially game-changing trial in several ways. First, it alters the way we traditionally do trials where we really don't know whether a treatment has worked or not until the end of the trial by using an adaptive design, which is dynamic and allows us to evaluate how treatments are working in individual patients as the trial progresses and also 
enables the assignment of patients to treatments that have the best chance of working for them based on the data from the trial so far. I consider GBM Agile a game changer because it combines the need for a rigorous evaluation of new agents in a randomized design with other goals that most trials don't have. And those include the adaptive randomization strategy, which favors active agents, the reduction of the number of patients receiving standard of care, which serves as a control group, and also the ability to rapidly move through phase two and phase three stages of evaluation. What makes GBM Agile a game changer? I think GBM is a game changer for multiple reasons. It's leveraging a large network of international experts that are all focused and experienced in developing novel agents for GBM allows patients to be exposed to the most promising um, therapies. And as agents become identified as not being as successful, those are, are taken off of the clinical trial. I think the benefits of this type of clinical trial and GBM Agile in particular is really to get exposure to and have the opportunity to join uh, cutting edge clinical research, to get exposure to novel therapies that are not available in other settings to be a part of making history. Patients with GBM benefit from having leading institutions with the leading investigators in the field conduct the studies. Drug companies benefit because the study is done in a very routine way over and over again. So studies can be conducted very efficiently. And because of discussions and agreement with regulatory agencies, we believe that this will really bring an advance in the ability to get drugs approved rapidly and efficiently for the treatment of this terrible disease. How do patients benefit from trials like GBM Agile? GBM Agile will evaluate and compare multiple promising therapies more quickly, which translates into more patients having expedient access to more effective brain tumor therapies. The design of the trial allows us to use information gained by each patient enrolled in the trial to maximize the efficiency in terms of determining which drugs in the trial are working well for certain patients and which may not be, and also maximize the chances that future patients enrolled in the trial are assigned to treatments that could have the maximum benefit. This is the, the real benefit of the adaptive design rather than a standard randomized clinical trial design. Because it's more efficient and cost-effective, hopefully more companies will allow their agents to be evaluated for glioblastomas. We will identify treatments that are helpful sooner and this will lead to better treatments for patients with glioblastomas. And because it's a very large international trial, hopefully many more patients will have the opportunity to join these clinical trials and have the opportunity of being treated with these novel agents. This is a really wonderful effort in which researchers throughout the field come, are coming together to find better treatments. And hopefully we will find the much needed treatments for our patients sooner rather than later. GBM Agile is an international adaptive platform trial. International in the sense that we are currently open in the United States and have been open for the last year, but are working to open in Canada by later this summer and in Europe and in China early next year. Our goal is to be able to make this trial and some of the potentially beneficial drugs available to patients across the globe. As the novel coronavirus has swept across the world, many research studies have had to pause their activities. However, due to the thoughtful and flexible design of GBM Agile, we were able to rapidly pivot into fully remote activities. We allow patients to see their study doctors with using telemedicine, and we'll even mail study drug to a patient's home if they need it. 
This allows us to maximize our patient's safety while ensuring they're getting the highest quality of care. We continue to strive to adapt to the ever-changing uh, challenges that the pandemic has thrown at us to ensure that our patients with glioblastoma are having the most options for treatment possible. We are so honored to be here to support GBM Awareness Day and think so important to be able to uh, provide education, uh, funding, and uh, advocacy for a, a community that so desperately needs new and beneficial treatments. Thank you. Finally, with MBTS's support, glioblastoma and brain tumor scientists, researchers, clinicians have come together to work and collaborate together with GBM Agile. This has uh, truly created a learning environment where we no longer work in silos and we're all collaborating to find a cure for glioblastoma. I'd like to conclude by thanking National Brain Tumor Society for allowing me to speak to you uh, on this GBM Awareness Day. I also want to thank them for their help, support, encouragement for making GBM Agile a reality. I wish all of you good health and I'm grateful to MBTS. Hi, my name is Colin Gerner and I'm the president and co-founder of Staff Strong, a 501c3 not-for-profit charity focused on raising funds and awareness for brain cancer research. July 22nd is a big day for us and our family and so many others impacted by glioblastoma around the world. It's National GBM Awareness Day and we'd like to thank all of the champions of this resolution to date for the continued dedication and support. As many of you know, GBM often does not get the resources and attention that it needs and deserves and this is showing that we're making a right step in the, in the right direction. So why do I care about July 22nd? Why does GBM awareness matter to me? My brother, GJ Gerner, was diagnosed with GBM at age 28 um, in September of 2017. He fought for 25 months, uh, multiple brain surgeries, rounds of radiation, chemotherapy, a story that is familiar to so many watching this and those around the world. Unfortunately, he passed just about nine months ago, um, and this will be our first GBM Awareness Day without him. And while it's only the second, it shows how fast things can move with GBM. During the very beginning of his fight, we decided to live our, our fight and our family's journey very publicly. And, and my brother and I started Staff Strong, and with the help of our family, we've grown it into uh, a 501c3 that has raised over $275,000 to date. Uh, with the help and partnership with the National Brain Tumor Society, we helped uh, launch the GBM Agile, as well as most recently a personalized uh, peptide vaccination with Dr. Adelia Hormigo out of Mount Sinai in New York City. We've done a lot of things as a family fighting through GBM, as so many have, and, and our time wasn't enough. But GBM Awareness Day is hopefully putting the truth and the dire nature of this disease into the spotlight. And it's showing so many people while everything that's going on in the world, GBM is not going away. And it takes my work, it takes so many other great organizations work such as the National Brain Tumor Society and the commitment to continue the fight against GBM. Um, Staff Strong partnership with MBTS is important to me because it's helped us immediately impact research. It's helped us immediately launch trials and, and give to areas in research that are promising and need the funds. And it's something that obviously um, mattered a lot to our family as we were going through our fight, but will continue to mean a lot to us as we move forward. Um, I'd like to close by encouraging everyone to remember that just like Brain Tumor Awareness Month during May, July 22nd, GBM Awareness Day, it's one day. And those living with glioblastoma, it's a lot more than one day. It's every day, it's 24 seven. So while we celebrate today and, and continue to put GBM into the spotlight and hopefully continue to move forward with different research trials and clinical work and improving the treatment options available for those fighting GBM, just always remember that GBM Awareness Day, while it's one day recognized nationally, it's every day and we need your continued support, your continued assistance, and your continued love and 
um, dedication to charities such as Stat Strong, such as MBTS, to continue our fight against GBM. Thanks. My name is Amy McGuire. I am a speech language pathologist uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. I primarily work with adults with brain tumors at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I provide motor speech, language, and cognitive assessment and therapy, emphasizing preoperative and postoperative care, but I also see patients at other points in the course of their treatment. Um, I am very privileged to be included in today's NBTS GBM Awareness Day because I believe that having a brain tumor and especially a glioblastoma is a unique experience that is sometimes easily misunderstood and often under-recognized by, by not only the public, um, which has a lot of assumptions about what having a brain tumor means, um, and also what a GBM is, uh, but also uh, among rehab providers. And I say that as one of those rehab providers myself. You know, I initially didn't know how differently a GBM could impact neurocognitive and communication function compared to having, say, a stroke or a TBI, but that experience can be very different. And there's so much involved in the arc of GBM care, it took me uh, a while to appreciate and understand that. Um, you know, luckily I work with a tremendous team of providers at Mass General, neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, you know, nurse practitioners, radiation oncologists, cell pathologists, neuropsychologists, social workers, great administrative support staff. You know, it can sound tedious to list out all those providers, but I think it does start to get at just how complex the care and experience of having a diagnosis and going through treatment um, with GBM is. Uh, GBM is a diagnosis that patients will carry for the rest of their lives, and there can be a lot of topics to cover and support from a rehab perspective, and especially as an SLP, in my experience. Um, for some patients with a GBM, uh, having that diagnosis can impact uh, lots of different aspects of life, including work and leisure, sometimes engaging in social relationships, um, and that can come up at very different points, um, depending on whether you're going through surgery or radiation, um, if you're participating in a clinical trial. Um, so I really believe that connecting patients with GBM to speech language pathologists, PTs, OTs, any other rehab providers who are eager to support and learn about the brain tumor community is important and doing so earlier is important as well, rather than later. So thank you again to NBTS for holding this GBM Awareness Day um, and spreading information and the patient and provider experience to others. Um, we're all in this together. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Lathia. I'm an investigator at the Learner Research Institute, which is part of the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm also co-director of the Brain Tumor uh, Research and Therapeutic Development Center of Excellence. So it's really a pleasure to be partnering with the National Brain Tumor Society on uh, their GBM Awareness Day. So we're currently involved with the National Brain Tumor Society in the context of their Defeat Brain Tumors program, which is focused on an idea of testing a new therapy that kills not only cancer stem cells, but also may reverse immune suppression. So over the last decade or so, we've learned a lot about how glioblastoma, the most common primary malignant brain tumor, actually grows and is resistant to therapies. And a lot of this has to do with a population of cancer stem cells that we think are the root of recurrence. Uh, these cells are very refractory, very resistant to conventional therapies like chemotherapy and radiation. And there's been a real push to understand the cellular and molecular basis for not only these cells, but their resistance. Now, in parallel, there's been a lot of interest in trying to understand why glioblastoma grows in patients that have, in part, an intact immune system that is designed to detect and eliminate tumors. And one of the things that's been observed is the glioblastoma microenvironment, or the area within the tumor and surrounding the tumor is actually enriched in a series of immune suppressive cells. So the immune system has got multiple arms. One is to detect and attack foreign invaders, and the other is to sort of stop. So this is why your body doesn't continue to attack itself after an infection. So what's interesting is that in glioblastoma, these suppressive cells 
are uh, very potent. And our lab has been trying to understand where they come from, how we can kill them, and what role they actually play in tumor growth. And what's very interesting is if you look at a lot of immunotherapies, some of the reasons some of the conventional therapies fail is because patients have a large amount of these immune suppressive cells in the microenvironment. So where do these two concepts of cancer stem cells and immune suppressive cells intersect? Well, years ago, we actually found that cancer stem cells can directly coordinate the behavior of immune suppressive cells through a variety of factors. So what we're working on now, in partnership with the National Brain Tumor Society, is to try to understand what that language of communication is and could inhibitors that target cancer stem cells also target the immune suppressive cells so that by eliminating the cancer stem cells, you're also making the tumor uh, microenvironment more suitable for immunotherapies. So as part of the Defeat Brain Tumors program, we're thrilled to partner with Curtana Pharmaceuticals, who makes a, a drug that, um, that targets both the cancer stem cells and the immune suppressive cells. And this is really a good example of academic industrial partnership where, um, you know, together we think that we can learn more about this drug that, um, you know, could be eminently relevant to patients with glioblastoma as well as other uh, brain cancers. So we're also very happy to partner with the National Brain Tumor Society on Glioblastoma Awareness Day because there's a lot of information that needs to be presented in the context of glioblastoma. Some may consider it a rare disease, but it's a disease that we really haven't moved the needle in the past 20 or 30 years. And I think we're now at a, a place in history where we can learn so much about the biology that we're really well positioned to make advances uh, against this, this really dire disease. And uh, the more people who are aware of it, I think the better off we'll be. Um, and again, foundations like the National Brain Tumor Society are really pivotal, uh, not only to raise awareness, but to also um, generate resources for research efforts, like, like those going on in my laboratory, that are really focused on not only understanding the complexity of the disease, but also to partner with our clinical colleagues or industrial partners to uh, put forth the next generation of therapies. Thank you to the following sponsors for supporting National Brain Tumor Society's GBM Awareness Day event. Hi, my name is Lena Chow and this is my husband, Kevin Smith. We live in Albany, California. Ten years ago, we lost our son, Jesse, to a secondary brain cancer, glioblastoma. When Jesse was four years old, he was diagnosed with the most common childhood cancer, ALL leukemia. We couldn't understand how cancer could happen to such a happy little boy, so full of energy. He went through three and a half years of treatment with toxic chemotherapy and cranial radiation, horrible side effects, and the risk of potential late effects. But Jesse's positive energy, his curiosity and excitement for life, and his wonderful little sister Ariana helped get us through. Jesse did well and his doctors expected him to live a long life. The leukemia never came back. We beat the cancer. Jesse had his good health back and he loved being with his friends, biking, hiking, fishing, cooking up his own recipes, learning to play jazz on his saxophone, living life and growing up. We felt so thankful. But when Jesse was 14, we were devastated by something unthinkable, glioblastoma, an aggressive brain tumor. It was a secondary cancer caused by the cranial radiation that he had received 10 years earlier. We had to tell our son it was cancer again, ironically caused by the treatment that had saved his life. Brain surgery, more chemo, more radiation, and the uncertainty of his future, he never once complained. Jesse kept living his life with hope and humor. The tumors grew back and spread. We felt desperate with the lack of treatment options and clinical trials for his age group. 
It was excruciating to watch our son grieve for, for his young life, to helplessly watch him deteriorate with no cure. Jesse was more than a survivor. He was brave and honest in sharing his thoughts about the important things. He was loyal and caring to his family and friends. Even in the darkest times, he never lost hope in his desire to live fully. Jesse was just 15 years old when he died, and our lives changed forever. So with Jesse's spirit of hope, we began to try to do our part to raise awareness around childhood cancer. We began to write emails to Congress to advocate for urgently needed funding for childhood, childhood cancer and for brain tumor research. Even 22 years after Jesse's first cancer diagnosis, childhood cancer treatment still has not progressed fast enough. Unfortunately, we're still using decades-old toxic treatments designed for adults. We need to increase funding for childhood cancer research at the National Cancer Institute. We need more legislation to encourage childhood cancer research by drug companies. As well, legislation like the Childhood Cancer STAR Act is so important because childhood cancer survivors suffer late effects from their treatment years later, even secondary cancers like our son Jesse had. We must find better ways to treat here our children today. Let's all work together to make this happen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Mariela Philbin, and I'm a pediatric neuro-oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for supporting our high-risk but hopefully high-reward work on pediatric high-grade glioma. As you probably know, these tumors are among the most lethal in our pediatric cancer population, and almost nobody survives beyond one or two years after diagnosis. Why that is, we really don't understand so far, but we do know that our current treatments do not work. So how can we find a completely new approach to target these tumors? One way is to look at not only the cancer cells or tumor as a whole, but also look at the interactions of the tumor cells with the normal cells that surround and feed them. And what we do to get a handle on this is single cell RNA sequencing, which means we sequence every single cell within the tumor and not only the tumor cells, but also the normal blood vessels, immune cells and resident normal brain cells to find out what's actually making the tumor comfortable in the brain and how can we then interact or block these back and forth communication lines to find new treatments. One very exciting finding we noticed is when we looked at all the single cells from DIPG tumors or diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas was that all the tumor cells were not all the same either, meaning that some tumor cells were really bad in a way that they were stem cell-like, dividing a lot to produce more bad cells, but about a third of tumor cells within untreated patient tumors was able to differentiate or mature and become almost normal cells. They were still tumor cells because they had the same mutations and chromosomal abnormalities as all the other tumor cells, but their appearance and their behavior was much more like normal cells. They even looked like normal astrocytes or oligodendrocytes under the microscope. This finding was exciting in two ways. First of all, it means that even without any treatment, certain tumor cells figure out a way to become almost normal and be reminded of what they were supposed to do in the first place, which is to become a normal cell, stop to proliferate and divide, and start doing the job in the brain, so to say. But second of all, and this is very exciting to us, can we use this finding to therapeutic ends? Meaning that if some of these cells can already figure out a way to mature and stop dividing, can we push the remaining cells that way also? Even those cells that have forgotten what they were supposed to do. And thereby, in addition to just killing the tumor cells, differentiate the cells and use that as a new way for treating our children and young adults with these horrible tumors. The hope we have generated with these findings in our lab is very palpable, as we have now moved to the next step and indeed have already found a few genetic targets and also chemicals that target these genes that when given to DIBG and GBM cells can actually push cancer cells towards maturation. We believe that this could ring in a new phase of treatment for pediatric and young adult brain tumors. And we couldn't have done this without your support. In addition to this initial attempt of finding all the single cells within high-grade gliomas, we also recently started a project called Project HOPE. 
This is a fantastic multi-center national study on not only pediatric, but also adolescent and young adult patients with relapsed high-grade gliomas. In this project, we work with many researchers around the country to find out not only what drives the original tumor of these patients, but then also look at the same exact patient's tumor when it reoccurs after treatment and ask the questions, what has changed during treatment? And who are the resistant cells who are now there and gave rise to this recurrent tumor? And most importantly, again, are there any new programs or even new kinds of cells we now have to target that are different from the original tumor? This particular project, HOPE, was only possible because of people like you who advocate for and support brain tumor research. Because big projects like this require not only collaborations across different institutions, in this case between Stanford, UCSF in San Francisco, CHOP in Philadelphia, and Dana-Farber Boston Children's Hospital, but it also takes coordinated funding and was only possible because of coordinated funding between the National Brain Tumor Society and the National Cancer Institute. So thank you again for all your support. We could not do this without you. Let's fight brain cancer together and put an end to this disease. We are now so excited to share with you all the reasons why we think single cell RNA sequencing is going to change the outlook on GBM and other high-grade gliomas. And here is what the members of the Philbin team would like to share with you. Hi, I'm Ashini from the Philbin Lab and I'm a postdoctoral fellow. I think single cell RNA sequencing studies are important because it gives us the most zoomed in overview of a tumor's molecular composition. I am doing this research because I want to help improve the outcome of glioblastoma patients and ultimately help find a cure. Hi, I'm Bernard Englinger from the Philbin Lab and I'm a postdoc with background in molecular and cancer biology. I think single-cell RNA-seq is important because it is a technology that allows us for the first time to resolve tumors at whole transcriptome scale and single-cell level. By this, we learn much about the evolution, coexistence and plasticity of cancer cell states and differentiation trajectories, potentially independent of known genetic driver events. I'm doing this research because I'm convinced that the sum of every small advance in understanding the pathobiology of GBM will bring us closer towards a cure for this tumor type. Hello, my name is Hefse Mire, and I'm a research technician with the Philbin Lab. The cells in our bodies become unique and diverse by activating different combination of genes. So single cell RNA sequencing is a powerful tool that allows us to study RNA that is transcribed from these genes in our cells. In order for us to find out which genes are active in particular cell types in GBM. Thus I use single cell RNA sequencing to get a better understanding on how certain types of gene fusions can be oncogenic drivers in GBM and how to target these fusions to combat these aggressive brain tumors. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Shaw and I'm the Philbin Lab Manager. I think that single cell RNA sequencing is important because it gives us the ability to see the difference between tumor cells and the healthy normal cells. I do this research because I truly believe it will lead us down the path for our care. Hi, I'm Lee from the Philbin Lab and I'm a computational biologist. I think single cell RNA seq is important because it empowers us to identify different types of molecular cells within a seemingly homogeneous tumor. I'm doing this research because my many children are still suffering GBM with poor prognosis out there and I want to help them fight against cancer so they can live the colorful life that they deserve so much. Hi, my name is Olivia Hack and I'm a research technician in the Philbin Lab. In my research, we're trying to understand the differences between primary and recurrent pediatric high-grade glioma samples. Using traditional methods, we might actually think these tumors are approximately the same. But however, by using single cell, we can actually see that there are subtle differences in the cellular makeup of these samples. And by analyzing the changes in cellular composition or in tumor microenvironment, we can not only see how these samples are different, but we can start to understand, say, how treatment impacts a tumor or even what drives a tumor's recurrence. 
And this could, for example, lead to new therapies or even treatments that could target these recurrence pathways. Hello, my name is Gustavo, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Philbin Lab. So if cancer is an enemy, single cell allow us to know him, identify their vulnerabilities, and map where or how exactly to target. I'm doing this because I want to improve childhood care. I want to see families feeling relieved, knowing that their children might have a hope and a promising future. I want to find a solution for this devastating disease. Hi, I'm Elon Liu, a postdoctoral researcher in the Philbin Lab. One of the main challenges in tackling glioblastoma is that we have to imagine these tumors as each being a unique, highly complex biological organism or system within the brain. And now, single-cell RNA sequencing presents a tremendous tool to study these complex systems at the highest resolution possible. Single-cell RNA sequencing helps to uncover the unique composition of each individual glioblastoma and to find more precise biomarkers and targets. I am doing this research because as a physician, I strive to be able to offer better explanations and treatment options for my patients. We are going all in for the fight against pediatric, adolescent and adult GBM. We will win this fight together. My name is Erin Pink and I live in Pennsylvania. My family organizes the Madison Brain Tumor 5K in Madison, Wisconsin. My father-in-law, Doug, had glioblastoma and was our reason for getting involved in the National Brain Tumor Society and starting this event. We started the Douglas M. Pink Run Walk for glioblastoma in 2014 with 225 participants and raised $20,000. Our event has changed and grown and we have now renamed the event the Madison Brain Tumor 5K because we have built a community that comes together to support each other. The back of our shirt honors the lives of over 130 people whose loved ones participate in our event. Last year, we had approximately 1,100 participants from 22 states and raised $72,000. We are overwhelmed by the support for our community, um, of our community for our virtual event this year. We had 700 participants and raised over $41,000, our second largest event to date. Seven years ago, when we decided to start this event, our goal was to honor Doug's life and raise money in, for research in hopes of finding a cure. We never imagined that our event would grow the way it has and our community of support would be created. I am honored to be part of the GBM Awareness Day. It is another way to honor Doug and the others in our community. Learn more about Defeat GBM and continue to take action towards finding a cure. Hi, my name is Luann Pink and this is my daughter Hillary. We are from Wanakee, Wisconsin. I have two sons, Matthew in Pennsylvania and Jeffrey in New Hampshire. Together we organize a 5K each July in Madison, Wisconsin to support the research efforts to defeat glioblastoma. My husband Doug died after a five month battle with GBM. My family started the Madison Brain Tumor 5K to remember Doug and to create awareness and offer support to all the families who have lost a loved one to a brain tumor. GBM Awareness Day is a day to remember Doug and also make aware the support and research that is being done to hopefully find a cure. Hi, my name is Josh Allen and I'm Chief Scientific Officer at Oncoceutics. Today, I'd like to share with you my cause for optimism uh, about new treatments for glioblastoma and other kinds of brain cancer. Uh, the reason why I'm optimistic has to do with the change in the way that we understand this disease. So it's important to start with the historical perspective of how we have thought about 
defining this disease. So here is what one of the earliest snapshots are that we have clinically of glioblastoma. Uh, typically, the first time we see the disease, it shows up on an MRI, as you can see here, uh, lighting up in the center as this contrast-enhancing mass. And at this point um, in, in the workup of the disease, we're really not sure exactly what it is. We're not even sure it's glioblastoma. All we know is that this is a, a large mass in the brain uh, that shouldn't be there. Um, it's disrupting um, uh, the function of normal brain tissue that would be there carrying out important roles. So at this point, all we know this is this is a brain mass, uh, and we should probably get in there and remove it. Um, while sparing as much normal tissue as we can. So the point at which we know uh, that, that tumors are, are a glioblastoma or some other kind of brain cancer is, uh, occurs once we have a chance to take out that mass and look at it uh, under the microscope. And this is what we typically see um, uh, when we stain uh, these cells and put them on a slide and visualize them under the microscope. Uh, on the left when it's normal brain tissue. Um, so what you can see there is the dark little spots are spread out nicely apart from each other and they're doing things that they should normally be doing. Uh, and this is a very different picture than what you see on the right, uh, which is tissue uh, that is taken from a patient who has glioblastoma. And so in contrast, you can see the dark little spots are crammed all in next to each other. There's a lot of them. There are many irregular shapes, uh, and what that's showing you is that those cells have become malignant. They're proliferating out of control and aren't in check anymore, and it tells us there's a lot of different things happening in that tissue that aren't normally happening. And uh, the diagnosis of GBM, or glioblastoma, um, is really determined based on what these kind of pictures tell us. So uh, th this diagnosis is based on how the tumor cells look, and what uh, other uh, specific components of the tumor other than those cells uh, look like. Um, so this is how we've traditionally thought about defining um, the disease. Um, now, how have we thought about drugs and treating this disease? Well, that comes from a, a, another effort, which is not just putting these, uh, th this tissue on slides and preserving them so that we can see them under the microscope, but most of those efforts instead come from taking those tumors digesting them up and finding a way to grow those cells under conditions that make them happy. So we take these colorful solutions um, and we're able to grow them under sterile conditions in a way that lets them proliferate and give rise to additional tumor cells. And the idea is that in those controlled conditions, we can then take uh, and change what happens to those cells. We could use technology to introduce different compounds in a high throughput way into that mixture that they float in, or we can vary other conditions and figure out what makes these tumor cells get more aggressive and grow out of control, and on the other end of the spectrum, what can make them die, and preferentially, what can make them die without harming normal cells. And so there's a lot more sophistication that goes into finding drugs these days, but at a conceptual level, this is a lot of what goes on. We grow these tumors in lab models, and we try to find new drugs that target things that cause them to die. Um, so this, at a fundamental level, has allowed us to prioritize a lot of ideas from the lab that have excited us enough to try them out in patients and perform clinical trials. And as many of you know, unfortunately, a lot of those ideas that work in the lab have not worked out in clinical trials. And so um, here's just a few examples. This could go on for, uh, you know, uh, slide after slide to show uh, uh, many examples of randomized clinical trials for glioblastoma that have not worked. So what we're typically looking for um, is to take a large group of patients enrolled into a clinical trial and randomly assign them to receive whatever therapy uh, and, and care they would normally receive or a, a, an experimental therapy that showed promise in the lab. And ideally, you would see these different curves separate. And unfortunately, despite a lot of clinical trials and new ideas uh, for several decades, those curves have largely not separated. 
there's only a handful of examples for different interventions that have actually been approved uh, for brain tumors, not just glioblastoma, um, it, because you know there's just been a lot of failures despite those efforts. Um, so what's the reason for that, right? Obviously, uh, the, the whole field has been trying to understand why there's so many good ideas that just don't pan out in clinical trials. And there's a lot of different reasons uh, uh, that people have put forth for these failures. Um, you know, for example, it may be that a lot of these drugs don't get into the brain tumor in the first place because your brain has a very robust uh, fencing system that keeps compounds out of your normal brain for good reason to protect it. So maybe those same robust barriers are in place and, and a lot of drugs just aren't getting into the tumor. So they never had a shot at working in the first place. Or maybe those models aren't very good, you know, that we have in the lab. Uh, mimicking the way brain tumors grow in a human is, is, is not a simple task, and a lot of the models we have don't do a good job at that. So maybe, maybe our systems and models aren't very good. Um, but there's another uh, a reason that I'm, I'm a big believer in and I think is making its way into showing promise for treatments um, uh, and, and one reason why we may be failing is maybe we're thinking about the disease um, uh, a, a little bit wrongly. We're really defining this disease, like I mentioned, based on the way it looks under a microscope and not exactly based on what went wrong in the tumor uh, at a molecular level. And we're starting to change that thinking. Um, so even before you get into the molecular sophistication, that idea makes some sense with what we've known for a really long time. So uh, go back to that, those survival curves I showed you earlier where, where we failed in clinical trials. Uh, even within those curves, you can see that there's a lot of differences in the way this disease affects people. Um, it doesn't all affect everybody the same way. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of you, you all have probably heard the survival of glioblastoma is about a year to a year and a half. Um, but, but that's really just the median. Um, that means that, you know, half the patients live longer, half live shorter. And when you look at these survival curves in, the, in this disease, there's a large spread uh, of different outcomes. So, for example, if you look in these curves I was showing you, you can see over at the patients, you know, that there's about, you know, 10 to 30 percent of patients that live longer than two years. And on the other more unfortunate end of the spectrum, uh, you can see that there is uh, roughly 10 to 25 percent of patients who live less than six months after being diagnosed. So that already tells you this disease is not all one thing. Um, there's a lot of different forms of this disease that can affect people in different ways. And we've seen that for a long time in the survival information from clinical trials, but we're starting to see the same thing now with our molecular investigations that we have. So this is some data um, that shows you uh, that same concept of heterogeneity, but at a much more uh, microscopic level. So what we can now do is take patients' tumors out after surgery or biopsy. We can break those tumors down into individual cells and then we can use these molecular tools to peer into these cells and figure out exactly what has went wrong in a very comprehensive way um, by looking for different changes that have happened. Um, and so uh, there's a few concepts in the data on the right that are important. Um, so, so one is that we found through these investigations that tumors are very different from uh, patient to patient. And the second is that even within a, 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 an individual patient's tumor, the tumor cells that make up that one mass are very different from each other. And both of those concepts are really important if you want to uh, beat back and defeat this disease, because ultimately you need to address and tailor treatments to all of the cells that have went wrong within the disease. Um, so the data on the right shows you what these molecular investigations tell you at a summary level. So each dot on here is an individual tumor cell. Um, each color represents uh, a patient. Um, and the further apart these dots are on this plot, the more different they are from each other. So the first thing that you'll notice is even within the dots that are all the same color, which is tumor cells coming from the same patient in the same mass, you can see all the colored dots are not piled on top of each other. They're, they're actually quite spread apart in many areas. 
Um, and that tells you that the tumor cells making up that tumor are very different from each other. The next thing you will notice is that the colors don't of the dots, they're not really overlapping. They're, the colors are kind of spread into their own areas of this graph. And that tells you that these patients' tumors are very different from each other. So the disease varies patient to patient. And that's not only important to understand at the, the philosophical level, so we just understand this disease is different, but it's really important actionably with how we can treat these. Because if we figure out what's going on in each of these individual dots and take a closer look at some of the data that's toward the bottom of the slide, what we find is these different tumors and different tumor cells have different things that have went wrong in them at a molecular level. And that clues us in on very different treatment strategies depending on what's went wrong. So we've begun to think about this disease, not just how it appears on a slide when we stain it with chemicals and give those colors, but we've started to think about it more based on what has went wrong at the molecular level. And so there's some treatments that have, have uh, begun to hone in on this and are showing promise in clinical trials for select patients that, that, that uh, are enrolled based on what went wrong at a molecular level and not just the glioblastoma definition of how they went, uh, how they look on a slide. And so I, I want to show you a few quick examples of, of, of this showing promise in the clinic. The first one is very near and dear to me because I've been working on this drug for more than 10 years. It's called onc one uh, And what happened is in the lab setting, I saw in my experiments as a graduate student that the drug worked well in lab models of glioblastoma, but when we put it into clinical trials, it looked like the other curves looked that I showed you earlier. It didn't work um, by the standard metrics for all glioblastoma patients. But what did happen is there was one patient who had an incredible response where her tumor completely went away in the area where it had started, and that response was maintained for several years. No one else in that trial responded like that. And what we found was at the molecular level, there was a specific mutation unique to this patient's tumor um, that sensitizes tumor cells to this compound. And so that allowed us to go back into clinical trials and not keep just looking at glioblastoma based on the way it looks on a slide, but rather search for brain cancer patients that have this specific mutation. And not only have we been able to see that that one patient's tumor shrank, um, but we've been able to see this in many other patients that have this kind of mutation. And this is really important because for years we've been looking for drugs that could just slow the, the growth of this disease down and prolong survival and give a little bit of benefit. But not only do we see these kind of results that are just trying to slow down the growth, we're actually seeing the tumors reverse course and shrink in some cases, which is something um, that has uh, not been seen before for these kind of brain cancers uh, after they grow back after chemo radiation and surgery. And that's not just something we see uh, with this compound um, on 201. That's a trend that we're beginning to see with other targeted agents, where again, rather than enrolling patients based on uh, the, their histology, as is, is, is it's called, um, but rather focusing on these molecular things that have went wrong and targeted them. So on the left, this is a, a similar example to, uh, um, uh, to ours, but rather than targeting uh, what onc one targets, there's an enzyme called IDH that's mutated in some kind of brain cancers, and there's an inhibitor developed that is um, just reported at ASCO that these uh, tumors are shrinking in response to this agent. And again, similar things seen uh, for a different molecular defect um, in a kinase called BRAF, where if there's a specific mutation um, if, a, if a combination of two kinase inhibitors are administered, uh, they're seeing response rates that are similar to what we're seeing with onc one in a different form of this disease that has that specific molecular defect. So I hope with that, um, I could share a little bit of why I'm excited about the future of drug development in glioblasto and other kinds of brain cancer. I'm hopeful that we're changing the way we're thinking about the diseases and that's allowing us to tailor treatments so we can continue to send more of this disease into remission. So thanks very much for your attention. We are Glenn and Becky Asher, and we live in Indian Land, South Carolina. In April 2009, our 29-year-old daughter, Anna, was diagnosed with GBM, and in November 2010, she succumbed to that horrible disease. Anna was incredibly brave and told us that all she feared 
was that she would be forgotten after her death. She need not have feared that. Anna will always be remembered for her beautiful blue eyes and curly blonde hair. She was the youngest of our three children and her only daughter, and she was an accomplished musician and a terrific dancer. She attended Virginia Tech, and after graduation, she went on to law school, and she was practicing in the profession that she loved until the GBM robbed her of the ability to continue. Anna faced her diagnosis with dignity, and she always worried more about her family than she did about herself. Through NBTS, we support the Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act. Anna's sudden diagnosis through a massive seizure instantly turned our world upside down. A palliative care professional when she was diagnosed could have helped Anna and us navigate the GBM disease process, as well as coordinating her specialists much better than we did on our own because we sure muddled through that. Through NBTS and Head to the Hill, we lobby Congress on this and other brain tumor related legislation. We're also happy to support the Carolina's brain tumor race and the race for hope in Washington, DC as they raise much needed funds for brain tumor research. We are honored to participate in GBM Awareness Day. We seize every opportunity possible to honor Anna's memory and to promote GBM awareness. We also feel that others should advocate because GBM is a nasty, devastating disease that can rear its ugly head with no notice and change an entire family's life forever. We must find a cure. Hello everyone, my name is Akanksha Sharma. I am a neuro-oncologist and a palliative care specialist. I am honored to be here today. Working with brain tumor patients, and specifically glioblastoma patients, has been a privilege for me. Glioblastoma is a vicious tumor. It is an unwelcome guest that invariably changes the course of one's life, and it does this in unpredictable spurts, which makes it harder for us to treat and control its impact. Yet I find that each patient that I work with and their loved one are so full of hope, love, courage, and a tenacity and passion for life. I am inspired every single day by my patients and their families. I see my role as walking with the patient and their family from diagnosis to the very end, through the highs and the lows, providing all the support I possibly can through this journey. It is not an easy journey, since glioblastoma snatches so much and we continue to be so limited in our treatment options. I believe strongly that palliative care is necessary in this journey, exactly for this reason. Palliative care alleviates suffering and improves quality of life. And those are two aspects that are so necessary. Symptoms can be better managed, emotional and mental health optimized, physical health optimized, and plans for the future can be put in place. Caregivers can be better supported. We all benefit and are better prepared with the inclusion of palliative care. National Brain Tumor Society has been a strong supporter of palliative care, and I'm thankful that on this Glioblastoma Awareness Day, I can speak to you as a provider who specializes in both. I hope that the information you gain today will help you plan and prepare for the journey ahead. And I hope that it will empower you. I hope that you will use all resources available to live as full a life as possible, and as long a life as possible. These resources should include palliative care. Thank you so much. My name is Eva Galanis. I'm a medical neuro-oncologist and brain tumor researcher at the Mayo Clinic. I'm also chairing the Brain Tumor Committee for Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology, which is one of the National Cancer Institute funded um, cooperative groups. So I do have the privilege to take care of glioblastoma patients in my clinic every day. So I witness firsthand how devastating this disease can be. This is also a point of frustration. In the last 15 years, we only had two new drugs and one device approved for glioblastoma. This is in sharp contrast to many drugs approved for other tumor types. And this needs to change. We do live in an unprecedented era of scientific discovery. 
our understanding of molecular biology of glioblastoma is deeper than ever before. We understand driving pathways. We understand cross-talking between tumor cells, normal cells, immune cells at the single cell level. So it's a great opportunity to translate all of that into therapeutic advances. We need to move scientific discovery into the clinic and do it fast. These are some of the things we are working on. Not all glioblastoma tumors are created equal. They have specific molecular characteristics and frequently also actionable targets. So part of the work we're trying to do is to match the right patient with the right drug. In addition, we believe there is a true opportunity in terms of immunotherapy, despite the fact that glioblastoma has not benefited today from the significant advances in immuno-oncology that have benefited other tumor types. Our understanding of tumor immunology is much deeper than ever before. That in conjunction with a number of weapons that we have in our immuno-oncology armamentarium, for example, um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, oncolytic viruses, gene therapies, vaccines, create a significant opportunity to turn this immunologically cold tumor to a tumor that is responsive to immunotherapy. And as we move with these new approaches, we need to do it fast. And that means using more flexible, more adaptive designs that allow us to both get answers faster and if we see a signal to be able to move all the way from early clinical trials to an FDA approved drug fast. In order to do that, we are committed to work closely with FDA and the other regulators in order to be able to remove barriers while still keeping drug development safe for our patients. We're also committed to working with our industry partners to make sure that the new drugs for glioblastoma are affordable for all our patients. And also importantly, our goal is not just to prolong the lives of our patients with glioblastoma, but to combine that with good quality of life. So to all of you, our patients, our advocates, a big thank you. You are our inspiration. You are our heroes. And we are committed to continue working hard, to continue pushing the envelopes towards finding solutions that will allow us to change the natural history of this disease. Thank you. Thank you to the following sponsors for supporting National Brain Tumor Society's GBM Awareness Day event. Good day. My name is Craig Frost. I live in Pleasant Hill, California, by way of Rhode Island, Arizona, and New Jersey. 26 months ago, I was diagnosed with a GBM in my right temporal lobe. Since that time, I have followed the standard of care, including 12 months of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. And I have been wearing tumor treating field since July of 2018. After two days contemplating the implications of my diagnosis, I realized I had some decisions to make about how my journey would unfold. My first decision was what attitude will I adopt? I chose positivity. Positive, I could beat the statistics, fueled by insight from my oncologist, and positive that I could participate in finding a cure and then be among the first to be cured. To fuel my positive attitude, I started calling the humbling number of people I've been blessed to have come to know in my life and telling them my story. I also stayed active and continued to do the things I love to do while managing my treatment protocol. I spent time with my family, 
practice my faith, and maintain hope for a cure. I also decided to not ask why me, but rather, why not me? We all have our crosses to bear. Mine is different now, but it is no harder or easier than anyone else's. Secondly, I felt that it was important to trust my care team, and I do. They have been honest and compassionate. They're highly knowledgeable and skilled and reasonably hopeful about a cure and additional treatments should I need them. Thirdly, I decided to control what I can. A well-known ice hockey coach one time said, control what you can and deal with the rest. I had no idea when I first read that quote, it would become a sort of mantra for me. So I control my attitude, my diet, activity level, and I honor the mind, body, soul connection more than I ever have in the past. Never too late to start on that, I suppose. After years in leadership positions, which included coaching and mentoring, public speaking and media relations training, a new purpose emerged for me use those skills to advocate for myself and for other GBM and brain tumor patients and their caregivers as much as I possibly can. I'm excited to be a part of the National Brain Tumor Society's GBM Awareness Day because events like this will continue to a steady drumbeat about GBM and the need for continued research to find a cure. And I do have hope for a cure someday. Please share that hope with me and bang your drum. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Snyder from the Henry Ford Cancer Institute Brain Tumor Center in Detroit, Michigan. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Glioblastoma Awareness Day. It is through the shared community that stretches around the globe uh, supporting uh, people facing a brain tumor and their families uh, that we can truly make a difference. The only way we're going to uh, impact outcomes and find cure, cures and improve people's lives faced with a brain tumor is if we can bring together uh, public policy, advocacy, and research into a concerted effort. And the first step of that to solve that challenge is to listen to each other and figure out what the true problems are. A couple years ago, I had a patient come into my office uh, with a brain tumor and she said, hey, Dr. Snyder, are you going to head to the Hill in Washington, D.C. to advocate for brain tumors? Now, I start all my patient encounters by say, letting them know that I'm their advocate, thick and thin, and I'm here for them. Whatever's going on, I'll do my best to, uh, to help them find the resources they need and, and understand the problems they're faced. And so I said, sure, no, of course I'm going to go. And so I went to the meeting and it was fantastic. We met with legislators, we shared our story, we worked together in unison, um, but I noticed that that patient wasn't there. And so when I came back from the meeting, I called her and I said, hey, uh, I was expected to see you. And she said, oh, I couldn't afford to go. I, because of my brain tumor diagnosis and the treatments, I've had to cut weight back on work and I'm, I'm really struggling financially to, uh, to keep it together. And because of my treatments, I, um, <clears throat> I didn't think I'd make it through the event. And I thought, oh gosh, this is a major problem that I completely overlooked. Um, how can we advocate for our patients if they can't be there to attend? Uh, and so I uh, secured funds through my institution and matched with a very generous uh, non national uh, brain tumor advocacy nonprofit group uh, to take five uh, people faced with a brain tumor back to that meeting the next year, including that, that individual. Uh, and it was such a powerful event for me to spend three days with, with my patients and see how they cope with uh, everyday situations that I often overlooked and, 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 and didn't really understand the challenges they were facing, and then to work together, uh, meeting with our legislators, sharing their story, sharing how uh, the resources that, that we get through NIH funding and, and, and other means uh, support their uh, issues and efforts uh, had a tremendous impact on me. And I think it had a significant impact on them too. Uh, being part of an advocacy community seemed to enrich a survivorship mindset and strengthen them, and frankly, those ideas were contagious. Um, and I never would have made that step without uh, listening to my patients and, and 
and seeing and understanding some of the issues they're having, uh, which is a continual uh, goal and need. Um, and so I'm super thankful for the National Brain Tumor Society to bring us all together today to hear what we're trying to do to solve the problem. More importantly, perhaps to understand some of these gaps in care because it's more than just finding effective treatments. It's improving quality of life. It's improving access to information for patients and their caregivers. It's improving access to uh, social work and uh, neurocognitive rehab and behavioral health support and uh, in many cases, uh, end of life support and, and guiding people through that whole process. And I think as we all come together and illustrate the problem and find these gaps in care and, and build out this network uh, throughout the world to support people faced with a brain tumor, we can truly make a difference. Uh, each of us can make a difference at, at, at each different level. Um, you know, of course we need better treatments, but there's many other things that we can do uh, too. And we're in pursuit of better treatments. Uh, we've got to keep that up. Thanks. Hi, this is Louise Craddock, and I'm the uh, lead advocate for the National Brain Tumor Society for the state of Illinois. I've been an advocate now for about six years, and I've been advocating in honor of um, our son, John, who passed away at the age of 35 from a glioblastoma. John um, went through 11 and a half years of um, four surgeries and a lot of chemo, radiation, infusions, and um, sadly passed away, leaving th uh, his wife and three little ones, his dad and myself and his brothers, and a host of uh, relatives and uh, friends. And um, we need to bring more awareness of what geo uh, glioblastomas are. They're um, a malignant brain tumor that is very resistant to treatment. And therefore, we need to um, provide a lot more research and ask for funding from the National Institutes of Health. And how we do that is by appealing to our congressmen and women. We'll let our congressional leaders know that every year there are approximately 13,000 patients that are diagnosed with glioblastomas. And of those 13,000, about 10,000 will succumb to the disease and that 48% of all brain tumors, malignant brain tumors, are glioblastomas. And in the past 40 years, um, there have been only four treatments and one device developed that are um, effective at treating brain tumors for adults and children. And that is just unconscionable to think 40 years, and that's all the advances we've made. So we need to appeal to them to ask for additional funding and to become advocates for those who can't speak for themselves. Everyone has a voice that needs to be heard. And I know a lot of people think sometimes, you know, I'm only one person, what can I do? But when you join as one person, you're joining thousands across the country in appealing to our congressional leaders. Who are the ones that can um, pass the laws and, um, enable us to receive them um, to please ask for funding for the National Institutes of Health and ask that that allocation of funding be appropriated for brain tumor research for not only children but for adults as well. So if you are interested in joining as an advocate, we would love to have you. Um, there's no large commitment of time. It's as much time and energy as you'd like to put forward, but know that your voices count, whether it's a phone call to your local congressman or woman, or whether it's writing letters, sending emails, or actually coming to Washington for Head to the Hill when we meet with the congressional leaders in person. Um, there's no, uh, no effort is too small, and we would Thank you on behalf of our family and behalf of all families that are going through the struggle. Unless you've been through it, you have no idea the impact that it has. Um, it's also one of the most expensive um, treatments uh, for cancer, and we need to address it as soon as possible. And we need to change that 40 year run of no additional um, treatments. So won't you join us please and share on, on social media on July 22nd that that has been designated as National uh, GBM or Glioblastoma Day and ask for help with funding. Thank you.
Hello everyone. My name is Salo Zellermeyer, and it's my honor to serve on the board of the National Brain Tumor Society. This is our second annual GBM Awareness Day. Unfortunately, this year we can't mark the occasion on Capitol Hill because of the global pandemic. But our cause is even more critical this year, as families and patients face the impossible task of battling this terrible disease during a global health crisis. For them, we must come together this year and push even harder for more research, better treatments, and of course, a cure. I wanna thank our families who show up every year, despite everything they're going through, to share their stories with policymakers and people who can make a difference in this battle. And I wanna thank our champions in Congress who honor their fallen colleagues by marking this day. They know this fight will take more than one day a year and we're honored to have their support. We know this is a trying time in everyone's life, but we are asking you to go to NBTS's website and pledge whatever you can. If you can't pledge, find a way to get involved, volunteer your time. I promise you, it'll make a difference. We can't thank you enough for being here. We look forward to being back here in person next year. Thank you so much.